I'm Lynn Jarvis, contributing editor for Across the Fence, and join me today for an adventure in Portugal, a country in southwestern Europe located on the Iberian Peninsula and the westernmost country of mainland Europe. And most appropriately, we'll begin our tour in Cascais, one of the richest municipalities in Portugal and one of the most popular tourist destinations in this country of some 10 and a half million people. In the late 1800s, Portuguese royalty chose Cascais as their summer residence. Its perfect location on the Bay of Estoril with an annual average of 260 sunny days were surely compelling reasons. The seaside village is about 20 miles west of Portugal's capital city, Lisbon, and is one of the richest municipalities in the country and the favored suburb for the affluent to dock their yachts and spend many happy weekends. Right in the middle of town is Ribeira Beach, and even on a cool but sunny day in late April, people were enjoying the afternoon sun. Historically, this is where fishermen would unload the catch of the day, but those times are long gone as the smell of fish didn't appeal to the growing number of tourists. Just behind the beach is downtown Cascais with its crazy tiled streets, making me a little dizzy and feeling like there should be steps, but it was perfectly level. More to my liking was exploring side streets like this one, filled with shops and fun places to dine. We can't leave Cascais without a stop at Parque Marcel Carmona, once part of an estate owned by royalty. To the right of the entrance, we got our first look at some of that beautiful blue and white tile that is seen throughout Portugal. Now let's cross this bridge and enjoy some of the sights and sounds on a beautiful spring afternoon. Nearby is the village of Sintra, designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1995 in the category of Cultural Landscapes. It is most famous for this national palace, a favorite summer retreat for Portuguese royalty until the 1880s. What do you suppose these two stacks were used for? Well, I'll show you in a minute. Our tour started in the elaborate banquet hall with an elegant ceiling painted in the 15th century. As you can see, it's divided into 27 octagonal panels, beautifully decorated with swans. Down the hall is the magpie room. Notice the fireplace with its exquisite tile work and parquet floors. Overhead, these ceiling panels feature magpies, and it is said they are a rebuke to the court women for indulging in idle gossip, like chattering birds. This is the private chapel for the royal family, and from above we can see the 15th century wall frescoes that feature doves, each with an olive branch in its beak, symbolic of the Holy Spirit. All the rooms were stunning, but this one couldn't be beat, called Sala do Brasos, it is decorated with the coat of arms of 72 noble Portuguese families with the lower walls lined with the 18th century tiles. Just amazing. This is the enormous kitchen used for preparing meals for the royal family and banquets for hundreds of guests requiring a 24-hour staff. Can you imagine? The original ovens still remain, as does the copper cookware used more than 500 years ago. And remember those conical chimneys I showed you earlier? They were used to vent smoke, heat, and odor. From the kitchen floor, you can look straight up to the sky, 
but does stand here on a rainy day. Nearby is Obidos, one of my favorite places in Portugal. And I'm not alone. When 13th century Queen Isabel marveled at its beauty, her husband King Dennis simply gave it to her. For centuries after, the kings of Portugal followed suit, presenting this picturesque little town to their queens as a wedding gift. It has been fortified since Roman days, and over the years the walls continued to be maintained and enlarged. Finally completed in the 14th century, they are just the same now as then, and one can walk around the entire perimeter. But that would take a lot of time and energy, so it's more practical to pick a few strategic vantage points for the best views, like this one, looking over an agricultural plain with fruit trees and vineyards just coming into bloom, and terracotta roofed homes and small farms spread out as far as the eye can see. To enter Obidosh, all visitors pass through this city gate built back in 1380. It is decorated with glazed ceramic tiles that we see everywhere here, often depicting historical scenes that are an important part of the architectural design in Portugal. Once through the gate, Obidosh is a labyrinth of cobblestone streets with whitewashed houses, made perky with splashes of blue, yellow and red paint, along with all kinds of flowers like geraniums, bougainvillea, and this beautiful wisteria. While here, I had to sample some locally made cherry liqueur that is served in tiny chocolate cups. It packs a sweet punch that tastes like more. It's delicious, thank you. Very nice. <laughs> then have your chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> All visitors stop to admire the Church of Santa Maria with its white bell tower, dating from the 16th century. Going inside you can see the walls are covered with those familiar blue and white tiles, and behind the altar are paintings by Josefa de Obidos, who lived here in the mid-1600s. It was nice to have a quiet moment in this historic church. Headed back to the bus, this street musician entertained on what looked like the top of a barbecue grill. Let's listen and enjoy some last looks at Obidosh. The Sanctuary of Fatima is a devotional shrine on a prodigious scale, a pilgrim destination on par with Lourdes in France. One cannot help but be moved by the intense emotion and faith of the penitents who approach the shrine on their knees. I felt guilty taking this video at such a private moment, but I wanted you to see and perhaps feel the spiritual power here at Fatima as I did. Worshippers from around the world visit to commemorate appearances of the Virgin Mary to three shepherd children. On May 13, 1917, 10-year-old Lucia dos Santos and her younger cousins Jacinta and Francisco Marto saw a shining figure in a nearby field. Over a six-month period they were given three secrets and by the last meeting more than 70,000 pilgrims had gathered to be with them. The first part of the secret was a vision of hell. The second was the fall of communism and a piece of the Berlin Wall stands nearby. And the third part, kept secret for many years, was a vision of papal assassination finally revealed by Pope John Paul II after the 1981 attempt on his life. Their tombs are inside the basilica, and in the year 2000, Pope John Paul beatified Jacinta and Francisco, both who died very young. Pope Francis is expected to beatify Lucia on May 13, 2017, on the 100th anniversary of the first appearance of the Holy Mother of Fatima. Lucia died in 2005 at the age of 97.
May I please have two of these? In the shadows of this most sacred place, we found a sense of humor at a nearby pastry shop where I ordered a local favorite, Pastel de Fatima. I hadn't ordered coffee, but okay. Oh! <laughs> heart attack! Heart attack! <laughs> and after that heart attack, I'm going to enjoy my Pastel de Fatima. Mmm, delicious. Now I want to show you Evora. As you can guess, the town rose to prominence under the Romans and flourished throughout the Middle Ages as evidenced by these columns that have stood for close to 2,000 years. This temple is believed to have been dedicated to the goddess Diana and over the years has been used as an armory, theater, and even a slaughterhouse before being rescued in 1870. For me, one of my favorite things about traveling is happening upon local celebration like Evora's medieval fair. The day started with a foot race in this exercise class. Here come the winners and those to finish last. After all that fun, I feel bad to leave the horror on a rather gruesome note, but I should show you the Church of St. Francis, or Bone Chapel. This grotesque chapel of bones was created in the 17th century from the remains of 5,000 monks. At that time, there were so many cemeteries in and around Evora, taking up much needed land for the expanding community. Not wanting to condemn the souls of the people buried there, the monks built St. Francis as a place to relocate the bones. At the entrance is a sign that reads, We bones that are here await yours. On a more cheerful note, let's move on to Montserrat, a tiny fairy tale walled village that maintains a charming medieval atmosphere. Due to its strategic mountaintop location, it has always had an important place in history and is one of the oldest settlements in southern Portugal. It was originally fortified by the Knights Templar, and today its 200 or so residents live in ancient white houses with wrought iron balconies and red roofs. The main street, Rua de Reita, leads to the main square and the church, now attended by mostly elderly parishioners as few young people choose to live in this remote place. We climb the castle battlements, built in 1310, for an eagle's eye view of the plains of Alentejan, now flooded by the Alcava Dam, built in 2002. And way in the distance is the Guadiana River, the border of Spain and Portugal. Montserrat is truly a place where time has stood still, and we were happy to be here on such a beautiful spring day. Portuguese wines are the result of traditions introduced by the Romans who exported and enjoyed it throughout their vast empire. From that time on, Portugal has been making and providing wine that receives worldwide attention. To sample, we visited the Santa Vitoria Winery opened some 10 years ago on 300 acres in the Alentejo, a vast region known for the high quality of grapes that can be grown here. Inside, we met Elena, who poured the wine for us. We're going to taste now the, the white. The white, how can I explain later? We use the white with Portuguese grapes. It's very young and very thick. The white was bottling in maybe a few months ago. And the acidity and the fresh is very marked in the mouth. And I hope you like and you enjoy. <laughs> and enjoy we did. I hope you've enjoyed our time in Portugal. As you have seen, it's a beautiful and historic country with very friendly people. And I'm pleased that you are able to enjoy this, all of this, along with me. 
For Across the Fence, I'm Lynn Jarvis in the southwestern region of Portugal, and thank you for watching.